I want to welcome everybody that's here. Thank you so much for taking time out of your otherwise busy days to be with us. Uh, this is an important time. Uh, there are a lot of technologies that are going to change the way that we work and live, and they're happening already right under, uh, right under our feet. And uh, you, you may have just heard the, uh, the wearable world talk with uh, Dr. Mary Beth Gandy from Georgia Tech, and, and she's got some great exhibits out there in the, uh, on the third floor here. And uh, right now we're going to talk about immersive storytelling. And primarily this is going to be about augmented reality uh, as well as virtual reality. And uh, I just before we get to the introductions, I just, I just want to say that you know, I've been following virtual reality myself uh, since the early 90s. And uh, it's come so far. And it feels like this is really the time that it's going to break through. And it's going to be an exciting discussion. So uh, let me introduce the panelists here. So uh, we have Lori Beard to my left joining us. Uh, she is, has been a technology pioneer for many years and has, uh, is associated with a number of very prestigious and, and well-known uh, universities and institutions. Primarily, she works with Georgia Tech and the Institute for People and Technology. And she's the manag managing director of Midtown Buzz, which is an augmented reality project that we're going to hear a little bit about today. She's also uh, associated with uh, MIT and has previously worked for ESPN with Time Warner uh, and is also associated with a uh, Future of Technology uh, initiative that uh, is uh, co-sponsored by UCLA and USC. So very qualified to be on the stage. Uh, Dan Ferguson is joining us from Dallas, Texas. Dan is the uh, Director of Interaction and Virtual Reality for Real Effects. Real Effects is a uh, an entertainment studio uh, that has produced uh, feature films, national television spots, uh, and most recently, the uh, acclaimed uh, animated feature, The Book of Life, uh, that was just came out in the fall. And it's uh, groundbreaking in its art direction and its uh, technique. They are also a, a, a very active virtual reality studio, and you'll see some examples of that today. They've produced for uh, film studios and brands. It's quite exciting. Randy Eckert uh, has joined us from real-time immersion. Uh, prior to that, uh, Randy was with Electronic Arts for many years, where he uh, oversaw many multi-platinum platinum titles, game titles, as well as uh, was influential in the success of the Guitar Hero franchise. Most people have probably heard of Guitar Hero. Uh, these days, uh, real-time immersion uh, uh, offers 360-degree uh, live and pre-recorded video for virtual reality and other applications. Finally, uh, Luca Magnanini is our vice president here at CSE of uh, Innovations, and uh, he is uh, overseeing the work that's done with augmented reality, virtual reality, motion control, uh, touch screens, anything that is uh, not online uh, in a web browser uh, is Luca. And prior to that, uh, Luca joined us from uh, Time Warner, uh, as well as uh, some work with the Walt Disney Company. All right, so uh, my phone keeps going to sleep here. Here we go. All right, so uh, we're going to start off with the basics because we know that not everybody's had a chance to uh, put on a head-mounted display and explore virtual worlds or, or augmented worlds. I'd like to, to make a basic definition and throw it out to the group. You know, the basic difference between augmented reality and, and virtual reality is augmented reality lays graphics upon uh, the real world and virtual transports yourself, uh, transports you to someplace else. So with that, I would ask uh, our panel here, and we can start with Lori, uh, how do you see the different applications or uses for, for augmented versus virtual? What's been your experience? Sure, thanks. Um, I'll start out. I, so I'm leaning way over on the augmented reality side, uh, the overlay on reality. Um, and the, the plus side, that's something you can do with others. So you can have a, an experience that others are involved in. You can, and if you go over to the demos that Georgia Tech has, you'll see a number of people can sit around and see the same thing. Um, it's an overlay in the real world, so you can interact with physical things in your, in your environment. That could be your neighborhood, it could be your work, it could be your kitchen. Um, there are, are um, um, easy, 
ease of use cases where you can use your cell phone, so there's not special equipment that you're, you're using, uh, or your iPad or something like that, and there's oftentimes a, a ease of use on the development side, so that you could do things in HTML programming, for instance. Um, so you can, you can do those things. There are certainly limitations, but I'm gonna let my VR folks talk about the difference in the immersive experience. You don't have that full surround sound experience. So, uh, Randy, do you want to weigh in on uh, virtual reality and, and how you've seen it applied? Well, you know, I've been working in the game business for many years, and the virtual reality thing has, has come on, like you said, many different times, and uh, was demoing a, a game called Magic Carpet in 1995. <laughs> and I had to wear the headset at uh, E3 and uh, was, was beating massive dragons and bumblebees. <laughs> So the virtual reality thing is, is pretty exciting, as, as we've talked about, um, well, we're about to talk about, in that it feels like the fans and the kids are really getting behind this right now. And uh, of course, immersing yourself in an entire world, whether it be building castles, fighting bumblebees, you know, again, back in the day, to some of the things that we're doing with shooting uh, 360 video and putting you in the environments of inside a race car or in a jet, things like that, it's, it's, it's a great, opportunity for people in the world to really be immersed in things they otherwise would be afraid to do or just can't get access to so great dan um you've done a lot of virtual reality work yourself do you have anything to add uh well we always tell people because when you're in the content uh you often forget that you're not in a building in the real world and the biggest thing is i always tell people if you get scared in vr just close your eyes <laughs> it's just virtual reality <laughs> People tend to really start to believe that they're in it, and I think as long as the content starts looking good or continues to evolve, uh, we're entering a whole new world of uh, people disappearing, you know, for a long time. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it definitely seems like, you know, the, the augmented reality technique of improving here and the virtual technology, uh, technology of uh, improving there, it, it's, it's a pretty nice, continuum of, of, of options there. Uh, I think VR does a really interesting thing to your caveman or lizard brain, <laughs> because as soon as your lizard brain sees a dinosaur running at you, your lizard brain is telling your feet to move. <laughs> <laughs> and by the way, if you want to see a lizard, check the Pacific <laughs> Yeah, yeah you brought the lizard. lizard yeah. in you have a 400 tall foot lizard in the room over there. I'm gonna make sure I say about five times during this presentation that we have a lot of really great hands-on exhibits on this floor. Uh, Dan from Real Effects has brought a number of virtual reality applications for you to try and it's very entertainment slanted and lots of fun and your lizard brain will get engaged. <laughs> Randy has also brought a whole bunch of uh, uh, virtual reality examples as well, primarily with video, and it really puts you in uh, another place in the real world, and it's, it's quite exciting. Uh, Laurie has uh, brought from Georgia Tech some augmented reality examples to try, and then uh, Luca has some examples that we've done here for clients as well, so we hope you take some time to check that out. Uh, I'd be interested to hear, you know, we have, you know, Laurie, you work with uh, universities and, and, and other distinguished institutions. You have educational experience, uh, seeing it applied maybe in non-commercial ways. Can you talk about what you think the differences are uh, in terms of educational applications of augmented reality versus maybe what's possible on the entertainment side? Sure. So there's lots. Uh, I'll talk about the application for education versus learning how to um, create an experience, because there's certainly a lot of learning there. Um, but if you go over, uh, we're, we're doing some, at Georgia Tech, doing some work with K-12 education. And so children really like to play with things. Well, what if you were trying to teach them physics? Physics oftentimes isn't something that's intuitive. But if you show them a map and say, there's a monster and he's trying to get out, it may not be a 3D monster and he's running after you, but you can see him. And then all of a sudden you have to look at, at vectors of how do you build a wall. So we have a demo over um, on the other side of the floor where you take little icons and you can move them around and as you do you see li lights that now are bouncing reflecting off of that icon and as you move there are several on the table and all of a sudden you can realize I can destroy this monster with a, my laser but you have to focus it and so you're physically moving objects on a table that will help children understand the dynamics in a very complex um, thought of reflectivity and, and physics and so we're creating a, a number of applications like that for children to understand pull and tug and forces and vectors that they can see through um, augmented reality for things that, that are very hard to explain or visualize otherwise. 
Um, on the commercial side, I don't know if we want to go into that now, I don't want to take too much of the time, but um, there, there are different types of applications. One of the things with, with augmented reality is it really is great for hyper-local, and if that's what you want, that's great. It's also a downside because it's really local. So um, we're doing a project here called Midtown Buzz, uh, also demonstrated, uh, but we're working with Midtown um, um, investors in the in, in Midtown community to say what is it you might like locally and part of it is how do you get people to walk around the street um, instead of riding their, their uh, in their cars but um, in Midtown for those of you in Atlanta you know there's a lot of development so there are buildings going up but they're empty lots so through augmented reality you can walk to a corner look through your cell phone now see the, the 3d rendering of the building that's going to be there now read about it and then in, in fact if you were the commercial owner you could say click here and and buy an apartment if you wanted to or again if you were at, at a restaurant we could when we have we've done some, some work with with echo which is a great midtown restaurant and we think well this is a foodie place I mean if you were a foodie what would draw you in so we have an application where you could step into the kitchen so you're you're looking at this wonderful foodie restaurant but then we also have video clips from the um, the chef and the sous chef that talk about their philosophy so it's not a sales so you don't want to do it it's not re replicating an HTML web page but it's an interaction that keeps you engaged with this local community and for the business owners you can offer up experiences that'll draw people in so so that's those are sort of two sides of, of the the teaching side and, and commercial side Maybe like a tourism thing too for historical like sure. oh. San oh yeah like all the things that were there weren't yeah. there yeah, it, it's really fun to think of because you could do what's there now or you could say what used to be there. So you could do photos of what the neighborhood used to look like or you could fantasize what might it look like. So you could start creating games to get people to walk around a neighborhood, maybe a challenge, a mystery challenge. But you could look at buildings and now it knows where you are and that building looks like a castle instead or it looks like what it looked like in 1800. So those are things that you could do that are in the real space, they say hyper-local. Yeah, so Dan, I'm interested, you know, with the virtual reality experience that you've had, you know, if we're, if we're dropping information on top of the real world and trying to make the real world more fun and interesting and information rich, can you give us an example of a great virtual reality application? Um, I mean, a lot of the stuff, we, we really push the limits on imagination on that, but, you know, we're also uh, creating content that, uh, you know, what will VR be like in TV or what will VR be like in tourism, which I'm sure... Capturing live action is great because I could feel like I'm inside of the middle of a, of a room that I filmed, which I'm assuming that a lot of what you guys have been doing in 360 versus, uh, you know, getting out there, seeing tourism, visiting a place that you could never get access to, or if I'm thinking about going to a hotel and booking a room, I could see what it actually looks like, what it feels like, and being in that environment. I'd be interested to hear from the group for marketers, you know, we heard uh, Dr. Gandhi say before that people tend to try to use new mediums uh, in terms of the old ones. You know, they want to strap the phone to their face and, and they want to do the things on the uh, phone that they did on the laptop. I and mean, this has been true, you know, radio plays on television and, and that sort of thing. Uh, what do you all think marketers need to, to think about with these technologies? How about Randy? Well, I, I will say that putting... Uh, fans or consumers in this kind of space that we're talking about, whether it's VR or using your phone to have an augmented experience or, or a headset or a mobile device like we have where you can immerse yourself, but then give a brand, you know, through a hotkey or something like that, the ability to, to then go to what they're, you know, what's within that video that then can link into what they're, you know, a place where they're positioning their products, I think is really compelling because what I'm trying to create is, is a fan engagement platform and brand that can create brand loyalty. And that in itself, when you're touching it, you're involved in it, you're inside it, is I think the coolest thing in all my experience of how if I love something, you know, to be part of it and get access in a way that I've never gotten before is going to build some real loyalty for me. And that's what I think brand is really looking for. Lori, I'd be interested to know... Uh, so many of the, uh, so much of the capital for technology early on goes into educational pursuits, uh, but working with it as long as you have, what are the commercial opportunities for augmented reality? So, um, there's the, the clear path that's already been used is on things like instructions in the home. So, how many of you have gotten uh, a box that has 
your desk in it, and now you have to put it together, and you're looking at 100 pieces and wondering what goes, where does this go? So using augmented reality for commercial purposes, like building that couch or that, maybe couch isn't a good example, that, that dresser, how do you match up parts? So being able to look through your cell phone, and, and this is something that IKEA and others have, have looked at. Another side, commercial side, is on um, how do you save people from making a, a truck roll to your house? Your washing machine doesn't work, and you need to, to change a valve or something. Well, how about if you could help people just look through their, um, their cell phone and see the part that's, that's broken, see where it looks like, get an arrow that shows where it is, and help them then match up something. So that's not really sexy kinds of things, but that's where you're seeing some, some um, fast movement in augmented reality in the commercial sense. You know, Luca, I know you've imp implemented augmented reality for AT&T and a number of other clients. Can you talk about maybe some of the special considerations? Yeah, so, hello. Uh, hello. Uh, so actually, it's very interesting for us because we often, you know, the, both augmented reality and virtual reality tend to be kind of intrusive uh, experiences, right? You always have to put go uh, goggles especially for virtual reality. So what we've been doing recently is actually focusing on iPhone and tablet, because in reality, even for virtual reality, and you guys prove it, once you have a phone in front of you, the rest is plastic, and you can create virtual reality. Mm -hmm. And for augmented reality, you can do the same, because there is a camera, you see through the camera, and then you superimpose images. Mm -hmm. So I think this has become more and more keys. So I think the fact that we are using more and more like uh, mobile devices, I think it's gonna expedite the adoption, especially for marketing type of uh, applications. So it doesn't have to be on a, a Oculus Rift or exactly. San, a Sony device. Uh, exactly. Dan, I know that you all have, have realized uh, worlds for entertainment, uh, not only with the Oculus device, which requires a computer and a powerful video card and such, uh, but you've also managed to translate those same experience with very little noticeable difference in quality to uh, the use case where you strap a phone to your face. Do you want to talk about uh, where you see that going for marketers and what types of things, movie trailers, commercials, like w what applications do you see? So, uh, wow, that is loud. <laughs> <laughs> and I was talking so softly. Hello! <coughs> Hello. Uh, yeah, the, the good thing about, so what we're doing right now is there's, it's hard to say what VR is, what the platform is, and how do you distribute it, and what is it used for. Um, Luke and I were just talking about this morning where there are all kinds of different price points to enter VR, and then there's all kinds of price points to enter VR with the hardware. So the content is one thing. Do I want to have some fantastic CG experience, which is a little costly, or do I want to create something uh, out of reality and then putting it into a VR experience, like having a crew come out and shoot it live action. And then you look at how do we deploy it. So uh, really a year and a half ago is really when uh, Oculus came out and made the big splash by setting up pop-up installations with all of their hardware, which generally cost you know eight to $10,000 worth of hardware equipment. It's fairly cumbersome, it's expensive to enter. Uh, it looks awesome, but it, it has a, has a uh, a, a hurdle there. Um, within the last year, Samsung Gear came out, and you know you cannot run something on a mobile phone that would easily run on a like let's just say PlayStation, PlayStation, Xbox, or a big gaming PC console. Phones don't have that raw horsepower. The graphics cards aren't that strong, and the processors aren't that strong. So you know we as content creators are faced with a challenge and. When Samsung saw uh, some work that we had running on some PCs at Comic-Con this year or last year, they're like, that's the killer app. We want that on our phones. And John Carmack and everybody else said, there's no way it can be done. John Carmack happens to be like two blocks away from our office. The Oculus uh, Dallas team is, or Oculus mobile team is in Dallas. And so uh, we actually went through and instead of recreating it, we found, we created a process that we can convert what you need heavy machinery to use to run on a mobile device. And we could put you in the machine, you could see very little difference. I could totally see the difference, you could probably see the difference, but most civilians out there are civilians. just, they can't tell the difference. <laughs> right. So the evolution of the technology 
is catching up so much faster than I ever thought it would that we're able to play these things on mobile devices now. Speaking uh, of evolution of technology, you have this funny looking cardboard oh yeah, box yeah. in your hand. What's that? Yeah, so like uh, the Oculus headset costs three or four hundred bucks. A pe 200, oh, they dropped it? <laughs> 300, 200 bucks. Uh, heavy equipment PC, uh, Samsung Gears, 200 bucks plus an $800 phone. Uh, Google Cardboard is $8. So, like, this is the uh, poor man's version of uh, VR, but it surprisingly works well. Everybody who puts it on is like, oh, wow, it's VR. <laughs> and even though it's cardboard, it's not very comfortable. It's cardboard. But uh, it works out great. So now you can distribute to audiences a piece of cardboard that they can take their mobile, their mobile phone out, not my mobile phone, download an app from iTunes or Google Play, and watch VR. So... Now it just became accessible to the entire planet, right? Uh, fairly inexpensively and pretty darn good. We're seeing a lot of interest. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, experiments. And, yeah. We're seeing a lot of interest uh, even here at CSC uh, with clients uh, wanting to distribute a uh, marketing collateral uh, that's branded that then can be folded into a VR headset that they can drop any phone into, download the app. The instructions are printed on the marketing collateral, so it's an immersive experience that you can send to somebody in the mail. It's pretty amazing. Uh, we're almost out of time, and I want to have time for questions. Uh, we can get to predictions as part of that. I'll, that'll be the first question. Uh, but uh, again, exhibits for all of the stuff that we're talking about, with the exception of the Microsoft HoloLens, is right out here on the floor. And please do take time today. They're here all day long. Ask your questions. You really have to experience it physically to appreciate it. So the first question I'll throw out to the group is, what's next? What's going to be the big change? That's on, is it Google Cardboard? Is it branded experience for marketers? Are they driving the capital? Is it going to be HoloLens and a game console? Uh, let's ask uh, Randy first. Or you can throw to Dan. You can pass. Well, I think the good thing is that... Hello. Uh, the good thing is that I think as we, with gaming and, and doing, you know, working at EA forever uh, and franchise-based products or films that are... People tell you what they want, and I think there's, a, like I said, a big m a swell of community in, in the youth uh, market that is trying to dictate this. And I was just at a upload VR conference yeah. in San Francisco. Were you there? Yeah. I mean, there was a thousand people there, and and every at CES, I had so many, you know, uh, folks out there that were were you know bloggers and other things that are just so excited about this. And I think. We're all listening in a big way, and, and there's, there's 20 of these that are being built right now from different companies, and, you know, it's, it's interesting to see where the hardware's going and where, what kind of content's happening, and so I think we're all, we're all ears, and we're trying to figure it out, and it's, it's a, you know, it's, this is like way, way, way alpha, you know, two. The, the, this, <laughs> is, uh, this is happening faster than I think, like, the mobile app boom happened. I really think I was around when it all was happening. It took about two to three years before it really started hitting critical mass. This is happening at such a, a fast speed right now that uh, you know, you're going to be probably picking these up at two or three conferences you go to yeah, within this year. <laughs> it will be in Happy Meals. Right. It's How? Actually, <laughs> soon. How? Actually, just to, we actually have branded version of those, which I think makes a lot of sense if you are a marketer. Yeah. Um, because you can actually brand completely the entire experience. And conceptually, you can brand the experience, point your phone to the, to the cardboard, and download the application. I mean, those are the type of things you can do. Well, I, I'm embarrassed to say this, but um, my son, who's seven, and I try not to let him ever use my iPad or iPhone or anything, because we're a Regio school, Steiner, blah, blah, blah. But the moment he saw the, the, the glasses, the, the Oculus and the sand, he's like, where are the goggles? I got to have them. <laughs> he was freaking out. And of course, the moment you see your seven-year-old, oh my God, you know, you're like, oh, right. it's terrible. So, know, uh, but it's great at the same time. We're going to try to stay on schedule here, and we're going to move on uh, to the rest of the program uh, in the building. So I would ask that if you have questions, uh, please do engage these folks. They're going to be here all day. Uh, they're going to have the individual exhibits through the floor. Real Effects is right over here with uh, virtual reality right outside this area. Uh, Randy from RTI is on the other side uh, of the stairs. Uh, um, Laurie uh, with Georgia Tech has a station in between. So there's so much to talk about. We think this is one of the most important trends in computing and, and marketing uh, as, as it relates to technology. Thank you so much, and I want to thank all of you for, for being here. Thank you. Thank you.